What's going on guys? David with Miracle Canine Training. We are here at the training center. I have a special guest in town. This is David, um, the dog trainer. 2.0? 2.0. One of us 1.0, one of us 2.0. Dave here is from Buffalo, New York. He's up here hanging out for a little bit. Uh, he's a good friend of mine. I've known him for quite a while. He's up here just hanging out, checking out some dog training related things, uh, just talking about business stuff. Having a good time? I think yeah. it's been pretty good. It's right? been pretty fun. It's been great. He's got a nice good mom puppy. Our dogs kind of kicked the shit out of each other a little oh, bit this morning. Yes, fun, did. good times. We decided what better to do than um, do a little Q&A here. We have some questions uh, you guys submitted to both David as well as David that we're going to be answering for you, giving us uh, our take on how we're going to go about working through these uh, questions. I feel like it's more like a Terminator relationship, or like I was sent back in time to yeah. destroy you, but I didn't because I like were friends. Forces. Yeah, so we're like the ultimate Terminator. For sure. So, yeah. we're going to get into the questions. Question number one from RTD3321. So, my meathead Clifford here catches on pretty quickly. I have two questions. You're cheating. What's the most effective training for basic commands? He seems completely oblivious to lay down. Two, he is terrified of car rides. Is there a method to make a dog more comfortable with a car ride? So, Dave, I'm gonna let you jump into this. Do you wanna start with the most okay. effective training for teaching basic commands? It sounds like this person needs more help with the down. I would agree. I believe I know exactly who this is. I believe it's Brian and Clifford. I know Clifford, big brown pity, cool dude. Um, so the way I would like to approach that with him is I would like to start Clifford luring for food. Right? I want to lure him into the down with some food first so then he can get some basic muscle memory. Then I'm going to add some leash pressure so he understands that I'm not suggesting he lay down when I tell him to lay down. And then uh, he is on remote collar, so then I would like to layer in the remote collar so then we don't have to get up and use the leash all the time to make Clifford lay down. Uh, that's kind of the series I like to approach the basic obedience in, especially with this dog. He's a little bit, um, he's nervous with new people sure. and he has lunged at people. So it's actually going to be a little bit of fun because I personally cannot handle the dog. And I don't mean like I can't train the dog, but I mean I physically can't get too close to him. Sure, in okay. That space yeah, yeah. Because I can't put that spatial pressure on him, he otherwise yeah. he'll go after me. Sure. And we've done uh, a few lessons, it's been going really well, and he has not gone after me, so I'd like to keep that. Um, so that's actually more of a, a challenge than I think to try and explain to someone how to lure the dog without actually physically showing them how to lure the dog. Yeah, most certainly. So, and from more of a broad spectrum here with something like this, you know, as far as, you know, getting into like the most effective training for basic commands and stuff like that, I like to tell my clients a lot that dog training in general, like at least effective dog training in general means having as many means of communication as possible. So those means of communication could be food luring, like you had suggested. It could be leash pressure, the understanding of moving with the leash into basic positions and, you know, more of a non-verbal physical um, kind of communication like that. There could be remote collar communication, there could be spatial pressure communication, and the more of those that we have established with our dog, the easier it tends to be to be able to introduce things. So some dogs are plenty food motivated enough where you could teach it down and get them into that position and get them understanding that position very, very simply, right? Like it doesn't take much effort, you can get them slamming into it and stuff like that. And some dogs maybe don't have quite as much drive and you can start to shape it with it and then you start to layer in your other means of communication. You have the leash pressure so that, great, if the dog isn't motivated enough with the food, at least we have another means of being able to get them into that position and then continuing to prove things with the remote collar and stuff like that. So I would say as far as the more broad, like what's the best you know, approach for training, it would be establishing all of those means of communication you know, individually and worrying less about specific positions because once you have those established, you could definitely begin to uh, introduce things a lot better. So. Um, yeah, no, I mean, that sounds like the way that I would go about with it. It sounds like if you've already been doing a lot of food luring and stuff like that, the next step would be adding that leash pressure into it and doing it in just kind of a slow, methodical, like non-confrontational way to not put too much pressure on the dog. So, um, part two of it, being terrified of car rides. I know personally I deal with a lot of dogs that have car issues um, and have, have you know had some fairly good success with it. My question would be, as far as terrified of car rides, is he getting car sick? 
Is he just getting anxious in the car? Is he getting reactive in the car? And that would boil down to a couple of things. I think that car sickness in general, um, from a medical standpoint, if you have a dog that's like constantly throwing up in the car, a lot of times can be very difficult uh, for, uh, to kind of inhibit because it's, again, it's more of like, you know, if you get motion sickness, I hate roller coasters, right? So if I go on one, like I'm inevitably going to puke my brains out. If I'm on the subway, I have to face the same way as the train. I cannot be sideways. Exactly. If I'm sideways, mm. Game yeah. over. So some dogs, if it is more of a medical condition like that, I've found that just eliminating the motion, like stopping their ability from being able to pace around and stuff like that by enforcing, say, like a down in the car or a sit in the car or something like that, could help get you at least some of the way. If they're very serious, maybe not all the way, but it could help get you at least a little bit of leverage. Uh, if they're just getting anxious, I think adding that structure, that obedience and stuff like that into the mix while in the car can definitely help get you over the rest of the hurdle as well. That's so. a, yeah, I, I tend to recommend people use crates in their car if it's a possibility. Definitely. So if you've got definitely. a larger SUV, yep. that's one way to easily eliminate that motion. Right? Yeah, because the dog sure. is going window to window, right? He's jacked up mm -hmm. because there's people, this, that, and the other thing. He's just working himself up, yeah. potentially causing motion sickness. But then another question I would ask is, where do you normally go with your dog when you get in the car? Mm, most, this is a good point as well. Yeah. Most people throw their dog in the car and where do they go? The vet, right? Yeah. What's at the vet? Yeah. Needles, people handling me, yeah. thermometers in your butt. Yeah. It's just not a pleasant experience. Or the contrary, in my case, so with Vinny, because most of my training that I did with him at a young age was in fields and in parks and yep. stuff, he has an immediate association where if we roll into the park in the car, his anxiety definitely starts to build, not from a sense of like being afraid of something or whatever, but just being excited because usually there's a lot of high arousal stuff going on there. Absolutely. So being aware of, again, like, you know, yeah, is there something that could possibly be causing that uh, through like just an association with a place? Yeah, no, that's a really good point as well. So I'd, I'd tell you, Ryan, put Clifford in the car, drive around the block, go home, pay the man. This is provided as not being sick in the car, right? Yeah. If he's just terrified of the car, Make him eat some dinner in the car. Right. Hop in the car, here's your dinner. You want to eat your dinner? Let's do it in the car, man. Make it a pleasant experience. Take him to the park. Let him outside. Let him run. Back in the car. Done. All right, next question from Corgi Mommy underscore RNY. Oop. I have a Jack Russell Corgi mix who just turned one. I am working with a balanced trainer and we are going to start working with prong collar um, because it seems choke collar seems to have no effect. My question issue is he is reactive to strangers. He also resource guards me and nobody else in my house. Any other suggestions or advice would be appreciated. Thanks in advance. Would you like to start with this one? Surely. Um, the first thing I want to know is, this is going to be a theme, we're going to sometimes a little more context might be necessary. For sure. Um, what I would like you to do first is ask your trainer what the game plan is and how you plan to deal with that. Yes. So then you can start establishing some sort of goal and mm, I want to say like uh, pathway. Yeah. Um, how would uh, so using a prong collar? Cool. Absolutely. You know, if, if that tool is going to be the one that's going to work for you and your dog, by all means. You know, if you tried the choke chain, it didn't work. Move on. Um, prong collar, remote collar, slip lead, right? It all depends. Um, as far as the dog resource guarding you, um, let's look at why, right? Why are you such an important resource? That would be the first thing I'd ask. Uh, food, water, shelter, right? You are the dog love. Are you loving your dog too much? It's odd. It usually is. So That's usually can, the especially case. Especially if it's not going on with anybody else in the house. Right. There's definitely some attachment issues. Attachment issues. So, um, what I would like to do is start getting your dog away from you, but in the same room. In my experiences, what I like to do with dogs at resource guard is I would teach the place command or the bed command and have the dog start spending some time away from you, but in the same room. So maybe three feet away from you, right? Because if the dog struggles with being away from you, let's make that happen, but also let's let the dog start to work through that issue by itself, right? Because you cannot offer that dog comfort because you're just gonna make that issue worse. 
Absolutely. Um, I would say I would say with that for uh, you know both ends of the spectrum. One thing that I always tell everybody uh, in my lessons, whether they're having behavioral issues or not with their dog, is start monitoring the attention that you're giving your dog. Right. Start monitoring. Are you trying to console your dog too much? How much are you petting your dog? Things like that. And you know, ultimately dictating who is in charge of these social interactions. Because I know from experience, a lot of my clients have dogs that are very very good at giving them obedience commands. So what I mean by that is, you know, how many times does your dog come up to you and stick their head under your hand a little bit and then you kind of just offer a little scratch because like that's no dip you know i'm not anti-pet your dogs or anything but that's no different than you telling them sit and them complying with that they're just telling you hey pet me right so start being aware every time you physically interact with your dog who's in charge of that social interaction and also start trying to go extended periods of time without petting your dog almost as a social experiment for yourself right can you go 30 minutes without touching your dog right because a lot of people as dumb as it sounds cannot do that it's almost subconscious absolutely right? they do it and they don't even realize it there's times i'm doing a lesson and you know i'm talking to the client and stuff like that and all of a sudden i just see scratch 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 scratch, scratch right and and it's again like I'm, i stop them i'm like hey uh, do you realize you're doing that right now and, and they're oh no i don't right i feel like that's that yeah. it's just like the perfect the hand, hand and the hands the head. there and the little yeah. head nudge and stuff and again uh -huh. not anti-pet your dogs no. you have to be aware of those things because unfortunately Dogs can only understand two things. They can understand when we like what they're doing and when we don't like what they're doing, right? And unfortunately, no matter how much you're trying to console your dog or tell them it's okay, or don't worry about it, or you don't have to be afraid of this, when you're scratching them, telling them that, that sounds no different to them than, good job, I like mm -hmm. what you're doing, right? And that's essentially reinforcing the demand of attention. Bingo, right? They're not demand attention. Obviously. And if you're having reactivity issues towards strangers, again, you have a dog that's uncomfortable that you're trying to console in a way that the dog doesn't understand and you're reinforcing that reactivity. So when I'm looking at behavioral issues, I always try to address one, the root of the cause, what's creating this, which the second part of your question is that the dog is resource guarding you, obviously, so you need to address that relationship dynamic. And then the second part is training the dog, right? Absolutely. The second part is going in and dissecting, okay, cool, like how do I actually stop this reactivity? Now, one thing I would say uh, in response to the very first part of that question, when you were talking about the tools and you tried the choke chain, it didn't seem to work, so you're moving on to the prong collar, right? A lot of people can get really, really, really stuck on the tool. And it's important to realize that one, the tool isn't training the dog, you're training the dog, right? So I could take a choke chain and train a dog because I'm gonna be using a little bit more of clarity behind how I'm using it or a prong collar or whatever tool you're using. Uh, but one thing I found from experience, because reactivity is probably the single most common thing that I get dogs coming to my facility for that have been to two other trainers, yep. three other trainers, and stuff like that, and they just can't get a handle on it because we're getting too caught up on those tools as opposed to understanding, one, the reason why the dog is doing it, and two, how do you influence that dog's behavior in a way that it's important to the dog, right? Because for some dogs, the e-collar isn't the correct tool for reactivity. For some dogs, the prong collar isn't the correct tool for reactivity. And one thing I found is that you have two types of dogs when it comes to reactivity. You have a dog that is more mentally dominant or more physically dominant. And what happens then is you have a dog that's mentally dominant, but usually a little bit more physically submissive, which means that something physical can interrupt that behavior. So say an e-collar, say a prong collar, something that gives more of a physical correction can snap them out of it more easily. Then you have the dogs on the contrary that I'm sure you've seen that you can hit them over the head with a two by four and they're not gonna care, right? They're a little bit more kind of just like, you know, full headed in their way, stuff like that dogs. And those are the dogs where sometimes physical things like e-collar corrections and stuff like that can actually amp the dog up more, right? We see that time and time again, people will say, oh, I corrected my dog with e-collar and they got more reactive. Those are the dogs where you have to do something a little bit more psychological to them in order to snap them out of it. And I found tools like pet correctors and bonkers and things that aren't physically interrupting the dog, but they're almost startling the dog more than anything. So again, tapping into that psychological aspect of things have been infinitely more successful in tackling those reactive behaviors. And what I've seen is these people that have been to all the other trainers have only tried the physical things. They've tried the prong collars, the e-collars and stuff like that, but not those other things. And sometimes then, you know, we get them in and we do one session with them. It's like, oh wow, like all I needed to do is just try something a little bit different, right. you know? Your, your tool is nothing more than a communication device. Bingo, and an extension of yourself. That's right? exactly what it is. And and that's where that question, I would like a little more context, mm -hmm. right? Like, why are we switching to a prong collar? Because correcting the dog yep. on a choke chain doesn't work? Yep, okay. Definitely. Maybe, maybe you're not correcting at the right time. Maybe you're not correcting the right thing, mm -hmm. right? So let's think, let's make sure we're understanding that the tool is nothing more than a communication Bingo. device. Yep. And one thing I did think of when we were talking about that is it's Jack Russell Corgi mix. Mm -hmm. Small dog. For sure. What does that mean? Oh, they're, I mean, they're probably carrying the dog a lot. They're Potentially carrying, putting yeah. the dog on your lap. Yeah. Right? 
I would avoid that during Definitely. this time, mm -hmm. especially if the dog's master's resource guard. guard. Yeah. Absolutely. Sure. Right? You're giving the dog the resource to guard. Yep. Right? Like, oh, hey, I love you too. Like, I, I love my dog too. Trust me. But. Yeah. If you're gonna be that way, yeah. you definitely can't be doing it. Now, that. super good point with the small dog and carrying, I didn't even think about that until just now. One thing I see pretty frequently is, let's let's discuss also first the idea that holding your dog and carrying your dog is usually always a bad idea. Now, why is that a bad idea? Because you wanna talk about the, the highest form of restraint that a dog <laughs> can feel, right? Yeah. Is when they're in your mm -hmm. lap, you're holding them like this and they can't move anywhere, right? One of them, it's crazy, we get small dogs in that are reactive and what happens is a lot of times when I tell the owner, stop putting the dog in your lap, the dog stops reacting because they don't feel so restrained anymore. It can leave. Exactly. You don't like they it. They go away, they move this way, they do what they want right? Great. So that is, that's, that's a really good point also. I just wanted to kind of touch on that as well, so. Cool. Well, hopefully that helps. All right, got a question here from Pets We've Met 614. Um, this question is, any tips for integrating a new dog into the pack, especially if there is a big age difference or energy level difference? Um, this is a good question. Uh, we get this pretty frequently um, where people are adding new dogs into the group, whether it's a second dog, whether it's a third dog, whether it's a fourth dog, which is not a good dog for dogs, guys. Don't, please don't. Two is a good number. Don't add a third. Lindsay, I'm talking to you. <laughs> um, so uh, basically the idea with adding a new dog into the pack, oh, and, and they also specified, obviously, there's a big age difference and there's a big energy level difference, which obviously is, contributes, right? It's important to factor in, but no matter what, no matter what dogs you're dealing with, um, it's gonna be the same approach anyway. So when I'm adding new dogs into the house, one thing that I try to do right off the rip, or two things I should say is one, um, set my rules and boundaries very clearly in my head before I ever even bring the dog in. So that could mean like, what do I want the dog to do or not do? And I need to have a clear idea of that so I can enforce things immediately upon that dog getting into the house. The other thing is gonna be making sure I'm advocating appropriately for each individual dog. What I mean by that is, I am ultimately there as lifeguard and like, you know, guider to, to control my dog in whatever way, shape or form that I need to. I shouldn't, my one dog shouldn't feel like she, you know, needs to tell this dog to stop doing something or vice versa or whatever it may be because ultimately I'm there to handle disputes. I'm there to make sure nobody kills anybody, right? So with that being said, set your rules and immediately upon getting into the house, don't have any sort of like, you know, contributing variables that could create problems. So take away the toys, don't have any food just freely out, try to avoid giving any treats or anything, be very aware of your social interactions with the dogs, right? Anything that could be seen as a resource that can put the dog in any sort of like an emboldened state of mind to start acting out or, or essentially controlling you or taking that leadership role that you should be having, you're gonna wanna eliminate those things and essentially empty the jar so you get a refill it back up, right? You wanna focus on coexistence initially. I don't allow a ton of uh, high energy play in the house. Uh, I don't allow you know, my dogs to treat my living room like a jungle gym or anything. I want calm in the house and then exciting stuff can happen outside. So setting those tones really clear uh, is gonna be important. And ultimately, like I said, just advocating, making sure if you start to notice that your one dog is getting stressed out by the other one, just pestering it all the time, pestering it all the time, you're telling that dog that's pestering to knock it off, right? A lot of people will do the contrary. They'll let the younger dog pester the older dog until the older dog Dog snaps and then they correct the older dog for it. We're like, you know, like, should, should they be able to tolerate stuff like that to an extent? Like, yes, yeah. right? But there's limitations for all of that, right? One of my dogs, when I first introduced the second dog into the house, started developing some toy guarding issues. And the reason for that was because my uh, my Malinois, my second dog that I got, would just steal toys from her all the time. And it's one of those things where, again, like, should she be able to tolerate that to a degree? Yes. But if she doesn't feel like I'm going to handle that stuff for her, eventually she's going to step in and do it on her own. We don't want that. We don't want that, right? That's how you get dog fights. You don't want that. So, um, yeah, it's advocation, right? Making sure you have communication established with both dogs. It's another big thing is people will get multiple dogs when they don't have their original one under control. And it's like, it's just one of those things where if you don't have the communication established, there's nothing you can do about it. You can try to interrupt all day long, but your dog just doesn't see you in a light where, you know, you're going to be able to influence their behavior properly. Right. So, and that creates problems as well. So training is obviously essential as well. So. Yeah, so you want to be Virgil here. That's a Dante's Inferno reference. Right? Excellent. You want to be the guide. Um, introducing new dogs to the house, I'm pretty particular about the way I do that. I'm a big fan of X-Pens. X-Pens, X-Pens, X-Pens. If you don't yep. know what an X-Pen is, it's essentially a barrier, right? Creating barriers so then if your newer, younger dog is pestering your older dog, you can still allow them to interact, sort of. Where one of them has the ability one of them, to kind of yes, give themselves the space if needed. Right? Yeah, for sure. My personal dog, my one dog Roland, is very touchy about his personal space, especially when he's laying down. 
I have a Malinois puppy and she's a Malinois puppy, so she's very annoying, right? If I was to let that Malinois puppy annoy Roland at, for great lengths, I would be back down to one dog because Roland, I'm sure, would make, make her not breathe anymore, which we don't want, right? So Malinois puppy spends time in the X pen so she can interact with me, she can be around me, but Roland can have his space as well, right? Removing things like toys, food, great ideas, right? Do not create the conflict when there doesn't need to be a conflict, yes. right? I'm a big fan of also, the first thing I do with, if it's not, let's say it's not a puppy, I'm introducing, like if I was fostering a dog, right? Last time I fostered a dog, the first thing I did, got Roland out, took Mag, she was a little min pin, and we went for a nice long walk. Went for a long walk, we walked in together, Mag had done some previous training, so I said, hey, all right, you're over there, you're over there, this is how we do things. Yep. It's always important that your dog that's pre-existing in your home knows the routine. Right? knows the deal, because then that's one less thing you have to worry yep. about. Right? Because it's very easy to just be like, okay, cool, Like I have to deal with this new dog right now, I need you to go over there and give us some space. Mm -hmm. I also do not allow play in my house. The yep. Inside the house is cool, calm, relaxed, like here's yep. a bed, chew on a bone, do whatever you want, you guys go outside, have a blast. Right? But yep. I also do eliminate a lot of interaction between a new puppy and my older dog outside, right? Because, yeah. well, you want to be the most important sure. thing in that puppy's yeah, yeah. life, so I suppose it depends on the context of your dog, Definitely. whatever. But making sure that you have a strict routine and a strict policy of whatever, right? This is the rules in the house, we do not deviate from them. Yeah, for sure. And one last thing I would say is, and something I, I consistently see issues with, uh, with clients that are adding second dogs into the house is, you know, if they already have a fairly toxic relationship with that first dog, say they're used to smothering it and treating it like the only child and all that stuff, immediately upon bringing that second dog into the home, things change, right? Yeah. You stop interacting with that dog like you normally would and they start acting out because of that. So usually what I say is that month before you go to get a new dog, really monitor those interactions like we talk about a lot and make sure that you're interacting with that dog in a healthy way and not in a way where it's just like all about you know this one dog right it's that dog show all the time oh. right so precursor like setting that up setting the tone nice and clear so that um, you're not having those issues of the adjustment initially right after that too so another thing that today brought me back to this point once you have this new dog in your house and you've got your routine down with both dogs blah 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 make sure you make time single time, individual yep. time for each dog. Definitely. It's imperative. I, I, I and not in a smothering way. No. Like, in a controlled way. Very like we're controlled spending way. time together going Absolutely. on a walk, right? We're spending time together working on some training or something like that. Just yeah, because I sure. can walk both yep. dogs doesn't mean I'm going to. Yep. I'm going to take one dog at a time and be like, here's the time. I'm going to make a cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take my older dog to the park. We're going to spend 20 minutes together by ourselves doing our thing. Yeah. Right? Just so you can still make sure that relationship is yeah. tip-top shape. Yep. And then the last thing would be then when you do start adding some of those resources that we took away at the beginning back into the mix, making sure it's with some control. Again, don't be allowing, you know, you know, uh, stealing toys from each other or eating out of the same food dish or any sort of nonsense like that where they would be competing for resources. Each of them gets individual ones, whether that's a food bowl, whether that's a toy, whether that's your affection, right? And making sure the other is not, you know, rehearsing stealing it. So if you're petting one dog, I don't want the other coming in and just jamming, jamming the head and fighting. And fighting and no, you like pet that. me now. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. So don't want that's that. the last thing I would say is when you do go to add those things in, which don't be in a rush to do so, definitely make sure you're monitoring that as well. Excellent. Cool. All right, this is gonna be the final question from Captain Han and Princess Leia. I wonder if they like Star Wars. Okay, I have two questions for your Q&A tomorrow. One, what steps or training board should a potential trainer follow? Examples, the CPDT course, and should I just call local trainers to apprenticeship? Uh, second one, uh, how would you help a very person anxious? We're going to answer the first part of this question because, yeah. again, we have a cheater. So sorry if we answered yours sooner, we would answer the second one. We might get into that one another time. So um, becoming a dog trainer, this is a good one. Um, I could share my experience, you could share your experience. Let's go ahead and do that and then uh, any tips that we have. So why don't you go ahead and start here. Tell us how you got involved. How I got involved. Uh, we will shorten it up a little bit. Adopted a dog, he was nuts, sought training, loved it, quit my job as an English teacher to become a dog trainer. Uh, so, apprenticeship, that word was in there. Yep. That is sort of how, in my experience, it worked. 
I apprenticed at a local facility and I did the dirty work for a long time. For sure. Right? I did the dirty work and I learned and I observed. Uh, one tip I can tell you is to ask questions, ask a lot of questions, but not right away. Observe. Right? The person who's sitting there silently is the one who's picking up all that information. So one thing I did a lot of was sweeping and mopping, but while I swept and I mopped, I watched and I listened. Right? I learned. And then I asked why. Uh, and then some circumstances allowed me to start participating in lessons a little bit more, right? Um, you have to have that passion to want to work because you, an apprenticeship generally implies that you're not being paid. Yeah. Definitely. So, so nothing, you know, yeah. nothing feels better than cleaning up diarrhea at yep. 7 in the morning knowing you're not going to get paid yep. to do it. But uh, as far as certifications, now, well, let, we'll get back to the certification part. Come on. Yeah, so, so my experience is really similar. Like, I got a dog. I didn't know anything about dogs. I never had one growing up or anything, and I wanted to learn about it. So I started working with a couple of different local trainers in the area. Uh, I found somebody that I started working for, and same deal. I ate shit for, like, a couple of, I, I don't know, like, six months or so, yeah. probably, while I wasn't doing anything except just hanging out and being around people that were doing good training. Now, I have a fairly obsessive personality, so when I get involved in something, I get heavily involved in it, and I want to learn everything about it. So same deal, observing, paying attention to things, starting to try to integrate myself in places where other people didn't necessarily want to, uh, and just, again, continuously exposing myself. And one thing I see a lot of people lack is the willingness to be able to go through those stages to get in a position to even learn about it, right? Absolutely. I took a massive pay cut to work for this dog trainer for a little bit, where, you know, like, I, I was doing terrible work. There was no guarantee I was going to be a dog trainer or anything, but I needed to be around it. Yes, right? absolutely. In addition to that, I would say while you're observing, while you're learning, taking everything with a grain of salt as well. So there are so many philosophies out there on dog training, and unfortunately, people can get very caught on either this one is totally right or this one is totally incorrect on both ends of the spectrum. Right? That could be, you know, some of the bigger name dog trainers out there that are doing, uh, you know, balance training and stuff like that, and, and people seeing that as like the only way versus, you know, the positive only trainers who may not be doing as good of work, but maybe are excelling in other areas, right? Um, so, so just learning as much as you can about all of them and then experimenting with all of it and only making a judgment on them after you've had a chance to thoroughly experiment with all of that stuff yourself. Right. Yeah, it's, and it's that could be with your personal dogs. That could be with if you have friends that have dogs. That could be go to the local shelter and get a dog and just try to train it. Right. You have to get hands on with the dogs, whether that means again apprenticing or working for somebody, whether that means you just figuring this stuff out on your own. Which I would say that you know I was able to you know even with with working with this person, I was able to reach out to a lot of other people and, and watch videos and watch DVDs and read books and stuff like that and try a lot of that stuff on my own and get a lot of really great ideas from it. There's also really fantastic seminars out there that you could find uh, but the big thing is learn everything you can about everybody right don't cancel anything out because everybody has something to teach you even some of the trainers out there that I do not think are doing very good work there are things that I've learned from them right uh, whether that's use of markers understanding the science behind training understanding how to influence dogs behaviors better socialization all that kind of stuff just learn everything that you can about it and put as many tools in your toolbox as possible and that's how you'll kind of create your own thing now like you were saying with, well with certifications right the problem with certifications is there's no nationally recognized dog training certification, right? So there are some out there, like you could do the CBDT test and like be a certified professional dog trainer and stuff like that, but who's saying that that's the certification right. that you need? There's, there's nobody saying it. That's no different than if you came and chatted with me or apprenticed with me. I could write you a certificate saying you are certified to train, you know, miracle canine training system, right? But how much water does that hold? Well, it holds as much water as people know who I am, I guess, right? Uh, yeah, exactly. Right. And there's so many people out there that are giving these certifications out. And, and again, like it's good in the sense of like, you know, you're learning, but like once you have that certification, it gets very easy to again, fall into that trap of this is the only way, Absolutely. right? And then you start limiting yourself mentally a little bit and you stop learning. You're, so, you're adhering to a system, which exactly. there is no such thing as a perfect system. Yeah. There's not, right? There's Definitely. What a, Don Sullivan's perfect dog system. Yeah. It's Man, not it's not perfect. Look at those dogs. They yeah. look terrified. Yeah. And any place that tells you you need to wear gloves to train your dog, yeah. I'm going to stay away from that. <laughs>
So but just in general, yeah. it's you know, it's one of those things where there's just so many different ways out there that there's nobody, unfortunately, there's no way that you can put a certification on it, right? So you just have to work with dogs, right? I don't have any fancy letters behind my name or anything, but not because you know, both Dave and myself here have done a good job of proving what we have the ability of doing. People, we, we hold water because of that, and unfortunately, that's the way you need to do it, right? Not by going out and getting letters behind your name, by showing your work, by trying things, and by just constantly improving what you're doing. I've been doing this for a long time, Dave's been doing this for a long time, and I'm still every day trying new things. I'm still every Always. day changing my programs. I'm still every day, you know, having my clients do different things. And, and you know, it's one of those things where I will continue to do that to make sure I'm continuously pushing the boundaries of what I can do and what I can keep learning. So, yeah. Reach out on social media. That's a good one. One thing I've learned, um, I'm not the most social human being, and in person. I get nervous, right, if I was going to ask somebody a question in real life, right? It's way easier for me to type a message via Facebook. A example, if I have a question regarding some exercise that Michael Ellis performs on a DVD or something, you'd be surprised how easy it is to just simply email the Michael Ellis school and get a response. Mm -hmm. It's not difficult. Yeah. Right. Reach out to those people. One thing I, I do suggest, and I'm not advertising for anything in general, but Learbird's online courses are great resources. Super great. For learning. I did a lot they're, of those. I've done a ton of them, and they're amazing. Yep. As far as the certifications go, again, I don't have fancy letters after my name. I have a master's degree in English education, which, again, Pretty holds... Impressive. My English is terrible if you've ever read any of my posts. <laughs> I can read books and discuss them with you uh, and write poems. Uh, but the letters are essentially that, right? I have a bunch of certificates that I keep in a cardboard envelope that mean literally nothing. Mm -hmm. um, you can spend a lot of money, what is it, ACB that, or a ABC, ABC yeah. right? That's Again, it's only going to get you so far. It's a lot of money right? for a lot of nothing, right? Because yeah. at the end of the day, how much weight does yeah. that hold? Now, one thing that I did do a lot of early when I first started my first business with dog training is I did pay for a ton of phone consultations with trainers. So I tried to reach yeah. out to a lot of trainers that I respected and paid them to talk to them on the phone for an hour and ask them as many questions as possible. Because one thing that a lot of people also won't have the opportunity of is we got very lucky with getting involved with people that allowed us to work for them. We, we got paid something at least for it, right? Man, or if you're yeah, absolutely. I was incredibly annoying about yeah. wanting to be Oh, for sure. Yeah, like yeah. If you want, if, do you want to know how annoying I am? <laughs> Go look up the barefoot dog trainer and ask him how annoying I was. <laughs> I would show up at his house and be like, dude, let's train dogs. Yeah. Let's let's do this now. Yeah, let's yeah. do this now. Be obnoxious. Yeah. Sorry. Mm -hmm. No, that's okay. <laughs> um, but like a lot of people don't have the opportunity to be able to work for a facility and get that essential right. like free training. So you have to be willing to also pay a little bit for it. And that's where you know instead of paying a large sum of, sum of money to get the certification, which some of those could be thousands of dollars, it's one of those things where I would rather that you uh, spend your money more diverse and buy more books, buy phone consultations, go to seminars, which may only cost you a couple hundred dollars as opposed to a couple thousand dollars, and you'll get more information from more people and have more things to be able to experiment then in the long term. So. Yeah, I would agree with that. That's uh, the, mo the best money I've ever spent has been on uh, seminars, uh, books, yep. you know, I'm not huge on dog training instructional books yep. as much as I am keen on reading books by dog people. Yeah. Um, Donald McCaig, M-C-C-A-I-G. Incredible books, incredible author. Uh, they're not training instructional books at all. They're not about dog training at all. They're about a man's relationship with his border collies. Look those books up. They're incredible. Definitely. But yeah, you gotta just kind of figure it out, right? You gotta learn as much as you can from as many different people and experiment with all that as you can, and then hopefully you'll kind of get lucky and be able to connect yourself with somebody that'll be able to hands-on instruct you more. Um, but you gotta just get hands-on with dogs and just keep learning. Shadow programs. Shadow programs. Shadow programs. A lot of trainers offer shadow programs. Yep. Um, those are incredibly valuable. Yep. Having been a part of a few of them, mm -hmm. not shadowing myself, but being an employee at a facility that had shadows, yep. While it seems overwhelming, you will learn a ton. Definitely. Because that's how you can get hands-on work. Yep. For sure. So, hope that helps. Um, yeah, just keep learning. So, hope you guys liked it. This is uh, Dave's Takes on 
dog training related things where we uh, try to answer your questions, we talk about daily things, and give you your insight onto all of these things. So, you got anything else to say? What's going on in uh, your dog training life right now? Mm. Learning, Learning, training, having fun. You know, there's not, it's the same old, same old, but the same old is good. Yeah, you know, for well, sure. I, I took a little trip out here to Cleveland, did the Q&A with you, that's pretty cool. Talking dog stuff. Super fun. Um, you know, times. talk about Skynet later and all that good stuff. Definitely. But, uh, you know, guys, thanks for your questions. It means a lot to me personally, and I'm sure it means a lot to Dave as well, that yep. you took the time to just direct message us your questions because I'm always happy to answer your questions. Yep, definitely. So, um, if you're ever in Buffalo, need dog training help, The Art of Dog, you can find him on Facebook, Instagram. Um, Websites. All Website is buffalocanine.com. Buffalo not the art of dog. You'll get a weird site that's not cool. <laughs> and then obviously I'm out here in Cleveland. If you guys ever need anything, and hope you guys like this. I'm gonna try to get back into the Q and A's. I used to do a lot of them. Haven't really done them in a little while. So hope you guys enjoyed it. Keep submitting your questions when you see them, and I will keep answering them. It's like my idol. Like actually, you follow him on Instagram? Oop, Salt Bay? No. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, that dude. Tenderize the meat for sure. Salt the meat. It's good. It's really good. For memes is Hamlet hold his opinion. Oh. Hamlet holding the skull and says, "Bitch, I might be." Bitch, I might be. <laughs> yeah, no. What if? <laughs> so we should just circle. Just keep doing circles. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just, just so the question <laughs> is. So the question is, how did you fuck the autofocus? Oh, yeah. oh, you didn't even have to press anything. You were rolling that whole time. Yeah. Oh fuck. Oh god. Jesus Christ. You said you wanted to roll. Okay. That's fair. Okay. Action. <laughs>